before a tornado destroyed this tower. So that tower is gone. It's been replaced. This is a 200 foot tower. That's a 9L 6 meter Yagi at 50 feet. So this is a quadcopter that's taking these videos. And there's another 9L 6 meter Yagi at 100 feet. Actually, it's about 80 feet. And that's not the end of it. There's another 9L 6 meter Yagi here at about 110 feet. This is all just a crumpled pile of junk metal right now. <laughs> So this is my favorite six meter antenna, but let me emphasize, you do not need anything like this in order to really enjoy the bin. This is another measurement. It's a little bit complicated, but what this is attempting to show, and this is from the observatory, is that the, the peak time of the year for sporadic E is from the middle of May to the middle of August. And the very best time is June and July, right where we are now. And this at the this summer solstice, which just happened a couple of days ago, uh, yesterday, I guess, is the very best time of year. And by the third week in July or so, it starts to decline, but still, still quite a bit of activity through the end of July. And this chart shows these heavy metallic ions. They recombine the electrons from that are released during the ionization process, recombine very, very slowly in the very thin E region. So these heavy metallic ions list, can often persist for many, many hours, up to a day and sometimes more after the peak influx of meteoroid. And this dust-like meteoroids uh, likewise have a, had a, have a peak arrival at around uh, sunrise to mid-morning, but they persist throughout the day and perhaps into the next day. So let's uh, get away from all that physics stuff. It's helpful to understand the physics so we kind of have an idea of what's going on, but let's get down to some practical stuff. These are some of the basic characteristics of mid-latitude sporadic E. The patches that we use, these high MUF sporadic E patches are, as I mentioned earlier, they're relatively small. 30 to 300 miles in east-west width, 10 to, uh, to 50 miles in uh, north-south width, width. But they're highly irregular shaped, and they also tend to be tilted, which helps to allow this uh, propagation from one patch to another. There is sporadic E every day in June and July. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it, it occurs every day and everywhere at the same time. So there are some days that are relatively poor, like today was one of those days. There was a lot of single hop sporadic E, but not, not very much of the long distance stuff. But yesterday was fantastic. So the variability is uh, very considerable. So by the time we get to the end of July, things will start tailing off. There'll be some good days in August, and by the middle of August, this uh, summer sporadic E will be pretty much over with by the middle of August. The direction you point your beam is always the true great circle azimuth. I've never, ever experienced skewed sporadic E propagation. It's always direct in my experience. You do not need a huge antenna. Three element Yagi is plenty. Of course, uh, it's nice to go to a larger Yagi and the five and six element Yagis are not that heavy and not that difficult to install. Horizontal polarization is very strongly preferred. If you could only put up a simple antenna like a dipole, make sure it's horizontally polarized. It'll, it'll perform much better than any vertical. And the optimum height for sporadic E is 50 to 60 feet, but you don't have to be at that height. That's the optimum height. Even the compromise height of 25 feet is only about 3 dB worse at a distance of 1,000 kilometers. That's about 670 miles. But there is a problem with low antennas. And that is, if you install a low antenna, and it's an area with, with a, a lot of density of housing or dense forests within a thousand feet of that antenna, it will suffer some degradation from all of that dense housing. And what do I mean by dense housing? More than about one building per acre starts to be dense. Now, none of this means your six meter antenna won't work. It's just that it's degraded by being relatively low and surrounded by all of this clutter.
And some more easily observable aspects of mid-latitude sporadic E patches. These uh, sporadic E patches occur every day in June and July, but not necessarily everywhere and every day. They can occur any, anywhere between dawn, anytime through the day and night, up until as late as 2 a.m. And I, I experienced that once about three weeks ago. And I haven't experienced that since. Usually sporadic E hangs in there until about 10 or 11 p.m., but rarely after that. The most likely time to find it is between 7 a.m. and 1 p.m. local time, with a very strong peak from 9 a.m. to noon. The variability of signal strengths is extreme. It varies from seconds to minutes to hours. Sometimes you'll see a signal from, let's say, Spain, and it might be there and then gone at one or two minutes. That's just kind of the normal variability. The sporadic E patches drift in these high altitude winds. There's a set of east-west winds that I described earlier, they're called zonal winds, which means they're parallel to the equator. And there's another set of winds that drift north-south along the meridians on the globe. If you remember when you study the, the globe as a child, the, uh, the vertical lines on the globe are called uh, meridians. So the Myriadonal winds are north-south following uh, that. So the drift that we tend to see, if you happen to notice that there is propagation that stations down in, let's say, Virginia and North Carolina are enjoying in the morning, there's a pretty good chance that that propagation will drift north northwards and we'll get to enjoy it uh, at more northerly uh, latitudes. It's pr pretty common in the morning to have it drift northwards. It can drift south but more commonly drift north. And then interestingly, in the late afternoon, the drift tends to be more southward in the afternoon than northward. So the, the variability is can be good, but it can also be frustrating. It's just the nature of the game. The angles of radiation that are useful, that is the radiation from your antenna measured above the horizon, very much favors antennas that are about 50 feet high. And when the antenna is much higher than that, more than 70 feet high. Most of the radiation that you want at needed angles, and I'll show you that in a moment, is in the deep nulls of a very high antenna. So you really want to have your antenna, if you can, at about 50 feet, 40 feet is great, 60 feet is great. 70 feet is really a DXers antenna. It's a little bit too high for some of the propagation. And 25 foot high antennas are, are okay. You can work lots of stuff with a 25-foot antenna, but if you can get it higher, then you get a lot of benefit from that. Horizontal polarization is what you always want to use on six meters. And the reason is the ground reflection gain that you obtain with horizontal polarization. It's just like getting an amplifier for free, but you'd really like to have that ground reflection in an area that's not cluttered with a lot of housing or dense forests. And it's nearly impossible to achieve this kind of ground gain with vertical polarization. It's too much loss. And the other advantage of horizontal polarization is that most man-made RFI, man-made interference from LED lights, from high efficiency motors that seem to be everywhere now, that RFI tends to be vertically polarized. So if you have a horizontally polarized antenna, you, just, you uh, reject most of that RFI. So we're going to shift gears again in the presentation and talk about antennas and all of the gain figures that are quoted on these slides that follow in a little bit are all gained with respect to a half wavelength dipole. A lot of manufacturers like to publish their gain figures with respect to an isotropic radiator. And the reason for that is they can quote figures that are 2 dB better. A theoretical isotropic radiator radiates equal power in every direction, but a dipole doesn't. It has a deep null off the ends, and as a result, it has a small amount of gain, about 2 dB compared to a isotropic radiator. So all of the gain figures in this presentation are compared to a half-wavelength dipole at free space. So let's look at some antenna patterns. The, this is a, an antenna pattern, elevation pattern, so looking from the horizon and then up into the sky, that comes out of a computer program called EasyNet, E-Z-N-E-C. That program is available for free. It used to be available only uh, by purchasing it, but the author of the program has retired, and he placed the program on the internet for anybody to download. But the only way you can get support for it now 
is from other hams who have expertise in using the program and not from the author. So why is a 50 foot high antenna so good? And the reason is that its low angle lobe produces its power primarily between elevation angles of three degrees and eight degrees, which is exactly the sweet spot for sporadic E. So this is where you really like to be. And if you look above that low angle lobe, there's a deep null there, but that null is at angles we don't care about. It's mostly, mostly would cover very short distances. This is why the 50 foot high antenna is so good. And usually with a 50 foot high antenna, you're up above the clutter of the housing that might be in our neighborhood. So that's uh, helpful too, to get up above that clutter. If we put it up at 70 feet, this is still a very good antenna for DXing. So you can see that that first angle lobe runs from two degrees to about six degrees. So it's a little bit lower. The only disadvantage to this antenna is that that first null above the low angle lobe is at some angles that are useful for sporadic E. So this antenna is a little bit too high for everyday operating, let's say in a VHF contest, but it's a very good DXing antenna. And one of the great advantages of a 70 foot high antenna on six meters is that it's way above the clutter in our neighborhoods or even forest if we happen to be in an area with heavy forest. Now, what about that antenna at 25 feet? So if we look at the low angle lobe on that antenna, you'll immediately see that it's much broader but it's starting to lose its performance at angles lower than five degrees. And those angles lower than five degrees are really the ones that are most useful for this really long haul DX into Europe, the Middle East, Hawaii, Japan, China. So this antenna is a little bit too low to enjoy the kind of performance you'd like to have at those really low angles. But for everyday use, it's fine. And it's only three to 60 B worse than that ideal antenna at 50 feet. But the, another big problem with it, an antenna only 25 feet high is that if it's in a very densely populated neighborhood, it's going to suffer from clutter. So some of that free gain is going to be lost because of all of the reflections off all the housing in the area. Or if you go to a very rural area and you put up a low antenna inside a very dense forest, it's going to suffer also. So if you're going on a VHF contest expedition or a grid expedition, find an open field, or even better than that, a field, uh, a hill that's sloped, but not with heavy forests. And you will really have a lot of fun, even with a 25 foot eye antenna, especially if it's on sloped ground. So this is what happens when an antenna is much too high. So this is a six meter, the same six meter Yagi as all the other charts that I've showed but this one is 100 feet high, and you can see what's happened here is that that first null above the low angle lobe starts just above three degrees elevation angle. So this really suffers for sporadic E. It's much too high. Uh, it'll work, but it'll suffer a lot more fading than an antenna at a better height of 50 feet or maybe a little higher. So we're going to start looking at some antennas now. So I already mentioned that the, uh, the gain figures will be in terms of gain with respect to a dipole in free space. And the ability to reject signals off the back of the antenna will use a measure called front to rear ratio rather than the more commonly used front to back. Front to back has a very narrow definition. It's the difference between the gain exactly off the front of the antenna to the gain exactly off the back of the antenna. But many antennas don't have their largest unwanted lobes exactly off the back. And this is an example of, uh, of an antenna where the biggest lobes are off to the side. So this is a very simple definition, and that is the ratio of the signal off the front of the antenna to the strongest lobes off the back, wherever they might be. So all of the gain in front to rear performance I'll show you is, uh, is uh, using this method of uh, measuring. So what about these uh, ground reflection talked about earlier? Uh, this is an example of how much ground reflection you can get. And you start to get tremendous advantage from horizontal polarization with actually quite low heights, as little as 10 feet high on six meters. But the problem is that the radiation is straight up, which doesn't do us any good for sporadic heat. So we want to get our antennas much higher than that, preferably, uh, as I mentioned earlier, at least 25 feet, absolute minimum, and ideally about 50 feet. And where this ground gain falls apart 
is if you're in an area with very dense housing defined to be more than one structure per acre, and it gets worse and worse as there are more and more structures, or with very dense forests, or with a lot of terrain irregularity, which you find more on the west coast of the United States than you do in the east coast. Most of our hills in the east coast are pretty smooth. On the west coast, they can be pretty drastic, and that can do a lot of harm to the performance of ground reflection from antennas. So many of you have probably heard of this concept called an imaginary image antenna. And for creating simple computer models, or even uh, in the old days, using slide rules and calculations done by hand, we tended to use this concept of an imaginary antenna that was uh, below the ground, uh, the same amount as the antenna is above the ground. But the important aspect of this is this is imaginary. Don't ever try to bury your antenna and get benefit from that. You will not, it will not work. But for computing uh, ground reflections, this is a, a legitimate model. But there's a little bit of a problem with that model, and that is that it assumes that the reflection is a single point. And that's kind of a crazy idea that the reflection would be just a tiny little point. So if it's not that, then what is it? How far in front of my antenna is this reflection zone that I really want to take advantage of? How long is the reflection zone? How wide is it? How much do obstructions degrade the ground reflection uh, gain? And how much does a regular terrain de degrade the, the possible 6 dB gain? So what about this reflection area? Well, in optics, there's something known as the Fresnel zone. And you can experience this if you go out on a dark night with a flashlight and just aim it slightly down towards the ground, and you'll see a reflection occurs off of the ground into the far distance, and it has this elliptical shape, and that's the Fresnel zone. Well, the same thing happens with uh, radio waves. And this uh, little illustration here shows uh, the general shape of the Fresnel zone. It's kind of elliptical. And there is 6 dB of ground gain available uh, very close to the center of the Fresnel zone, and uh, out to the edges, the gain drops down to zero. And there's a very excellent publication that described this situation. This publication is more than 60 years old, but it's available on the internet. So for anyone who wants to read about it in more detail. So the, in the edge of the Fresnel zone is defined to be uh, the place where the reflected wave, which is the wave down at the bottom, I'll just use my mouse here, the wave from the antenna going down to the ground and reflected back up. At the edge of the Fresnel zone, there's a 90 degree phase shift between the reflected ray and the direct ray. So that's how this is defined. Well, it turns out that most of the gain that we could get occurs in about the middle half of this Fresnel zone, uh, not the entire zone. At the very edge, we get no gain at all. So we're mostly interested in about the middle half of this Fresnel zone where the phase shifts are 45 degrees or less. And this is just, just an illustration showing the, the kind of the middle of the Fresnel zone giving us 3 dB gain and then the very center 6 dB of gain. And we really would prefer, if we can, to select locations where this reflecting zone is not in an area with many tall buildings and dense forests. So this is what, what an antenna 50 feet high looks like. The reflection zone in front of the antenna starts about 150 feet in front of the antenna. So we don't care very much about problems between the antenna and about 150 feet. But in order to get that possible up to 6 dB of gain from the reflected ray, we would prefer, if we can, uh, that that reflection zone from 150 feet in front of the antenna out to, to about 2,000 feet be relatively clear of dense housing. Less than about one building per acre has almost no effect. But as you add more and more buildings per acre, the degradation starts to be significant. Similar thing with very dense forests. Individual trees don't matter much, but if you have a dense forest that goes for thousands of feet, it gets to be a problem. So if you're going to a portable location, try to select a location where it's uh, an empty field or there are just a few trees rather than being in the middle of a dense forest that will have a degradation associated with it. And this is for the antenna at 70 feet. So this is a good height for DXing. And what happens here 
is that the near edge in front of the antenna is about 200 feet out instead of 150 feet out. And the far edge, instead of being 2,000 feet out, is about 2,500 feet. So it's a pretty big reflection zone. And of course, it's still subject to degradation by high density housing or very dense forests. And what about our 25 foot antenna that works pretty good? It's less than an S unit from the ideal antennas. One of the problems with the low antenna is that the near edge of the reflecting zone is only 25 feet in front of the antenna. The far edge is, only, is about a thousand feet in front. So if, if we have a lot of dense housing or dense forests in this area, it took, not only do we suffer from having an antenna that's not at the ideal height, but we also suffer from problems in the reflection zone. This reflection zone at 25 foot high antennas is about 100 feet wide. So what about a sloping site? So you know, I, I want, let's say I want to go out on field day and have some fun on six meters or the VHF contest, or just go out and go to a rear grid. If you can't put up a really high antenna and 50 feet high antennas are pretty darn inconvenient for a portable operation, especially if you're going on your own, you can get the benefit of a high antenna if you can find a hilltop where there is a slope in front of the antenna. So if you can find an area where the terrain slopes downward about 100 feet over a distance of about 1,000 feet in front of the antenna, well, all of a sudden your 25-foot high antenna, quite practical for portable operation, becomes in effect an antenna that's 50 feet high, which is the ideal height. But important to note here is that slope really needs to begin not very far in front of the antenna. That slope doesn't do you a lot of good if it's a mile in front of you. It needs to be right in front of the antenna. So now we're gonna look at some practical antennas and I'm not gonna dwell on any of these greatly. I'm just gonna point out some of the key aspects and you can go back and look at these slides in detail later. This chart shows some of the lightweight, small uh, Yaggies that are, are available for purchase. A very practical antenna for portable use is a simple three element Yagi. And it has pretty good gain, 60 V of gain. Where it suffers a little bit is front to rear ratio, but if you're out on a rural area, far from uh, metropolitan areas, then front to rear ratio isn't as important perhaps. So a little three element beam that only weighs about six pounds. It's very, very practical for portable operation. Put that on a 25 foot mast on the side of a hill and, and you'll be uh, really uh, doing exceptionally well for a portable operation. And uh, some of these small antennas have really good front to rear ratios. You can see uh, the one in this chart that has the best front to rear ratio is 24 dB front to rear. That's a conventional antenna. It's not for sale. You have to build your own. You can find the design details for this antenna online and I'll actually show you this antenna in a moment. The, the, uh, the big benefit of going to larger antennas, and I'll show you that in a moment, is that the front-to-rear ratio improves. The gain gets a little bit better, but the front-to-rear ratio improves quite a bit. The URL shown at the bottom of this slide is a website where there are many, many more antennas that are evaluated by VE7BQH. And you can see the good and the bad about all the various antennas that he has evaluated. So let's just look at a few of these antennas. This is a nice little six-pound antenna. Seven foot boom, very, very easy to install this on a 25 foot mast. One person with no help from anyone else can do this very easily. And we'll just look at a couple of the larger antennas. This is a 10 foot boom antenna, four elements, weighs about 13 pounds. Front to rear ratio is significantly better than the three element Yagi. You can purchase this antenna from DX Engineering as shown uh, at the bottom of the slide. And this is a five element Yagi. Notice this is loop fed rather than a simple driven element. And it weighs 17 pounds. This is getting a little bit heavy for portable operation for a one man portable operation, especially. And this is the YU7EF antenna. It's a split dipole Yagi. So there's no uh, T matches or gamma matches or anything like that. Simple direct 50 ohm feed. And the website with the design details is showing you no, there's no manufacturer of this antenna. You have to build it yourself, but six meter antennas are really easy to build. And this is a, another five element Yagi. This is a very, very effective antenna. The website is shown. So let's look at briefly some of the much bigger Yagis. And you can see if you look at the red, that the front to rear ratio performance of these larger Yagis gets to be significantly better. 
And that's really the main reason to go to a larger Yagi. The gain is a couple dB better than the smaller ones, but the ability to discriminate against interference is much better. And we'll look at some of these bigger ones. This is a 21-foot boom Yagi, but it weighs only 14 pounds. A field day group uh, with a few people to assist in installing an antenna like this can easily install it. Now, when you start investing in these bigger antennas, it certainly makes sense to try to get them up around 50 feet so you really get the benefit of the expenditure on a larger antenna like this. Now, notice this antenna and some of the others have chokes at the feed point. You can see that coiled coax choke on the left side here, right below the driven element. So notice how all these antennas will have a choke at the feed point. This is another antenna by the same manufacturer. It has really, really good front to rear ratio and notice the choke at the feed point right here. Coiled coax choke. This is a six element loop fed Yagi made by uh, E antennas. Uh, you can purchase it from BX Engineering. This has a different type of a choke. And I'll explain this one a little bit later, but you can notice below the boom is this choke assembly. This is a remarkable six meter antenna system. I don't recommend that anyone try to duplicate this. If you think about some of the things I talked about earlier, this six meter antenna system is, 100, is on a 180 foot tower. And almost all the fun that you would have with this antenna comes from the bottom two antennas. There will be some circumstances where the higher antennas are worthwhile, but the expense of this system is just incredible. Whereas for a tiny fraction of the cost of this system, you can install the bottom two antennas and really have a blast. This is yet somewhat larger antenna, 31 feet long, not very practical for most portable operations. This is a T-matched Yagi made by M Square. It has pretty good front to rear ratio. And this is one of the best antenna systems in the world for six meters, JA1BK. I've worked in many times, usually work him at least once a year on six meters. I had a contact with him uh, last week. And this is just an amazing system. It's a crank up tower, about 50 feet high, more or less. And these two uh, eight element Yagis are stacked about 20, 25 feet, something in that order. It's an incredible incentive system, but you don't need to have this in order to have a lot of fun on sick.